Tamara, welcoming everyone. So welcome everyone to the 2021 uh, Cycle Toronto Advocacy Forum and the How Bike Lanes Get Built Lunch and Learn. It's one of the most frequent questions we receive at Cycle Toronto. And rather than hear, hear it from us, we've invited some of the people responsible for getting uh, lanes built at the City of Toronto to help walk us through the process. I'd first like to acknowledge the land on which we reside. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Today, Toronto is still the home to many diverse, diverse First Nations, Inuit Métis people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to gather and work on this land. We also acknowledge that Toronto is home to many immigrants and many people, descendants and children of people were forcibly removed from their homes. Many people today suffer the generational trauma resulting from the legacy of colonialism and we acknowledge that we live and work on the lands of Toronto and neighbours. So my name is Michael Longfield and I'm the uh, Interim Executive Director of Cycle Toronto. And I'd just like to go over our agenda. First, I'll introduce our speakers. I'm really excited to have all three of them here. And then we'll dive into the presentations. And then at the end, we'll have about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. And if you have any questions, please write them down. But we do ask that you hold on to them until uh, near the end so the chat box isn't pinging uh, while our speakers are presenting since that can sometimes be a little bit distracting. And so if that uh, makes sense to everyone, I'd like to introduce our three speakers. Firstly, we have Deputy Mayor Anna Bailao, who serves as Council for Ward 9 Davenport. She was first elected to Toronto City Council in 2010 and was re-elected in 2018. She serves as Toronto's Deputy Mayor, Chair of the Planning and Housing Committee, and is an Executive Committee member. Designated Toronto's housing advocate, she has been a champion for affordable housing, leading critical planning and housing policy decisions at the City Hall to keep the city affordable. And if people haven't already seen it, I recommend everyone have a look at the new uh, modular housing units at uh, Dover Court and Harrison in Ward 9. <laughs> it's really incredible and transformational. Uh, specific to cycling, uh, Anna has succeeded in accelerating the Bloor West Bikeway extension from Shaw Street through Ward 9 and beyond to Runnymede Road and for being a champion of the West Toronto Rail Path. Next, we have Becky Katz, who is the manager of the City of Toronto Cycling and Pedestrian Projects Unit. In her career, she has focused on weaving her passion for collaborating with communities in planning and designing high quality public spaces and multimodal transportation infrastructure. Before joining the City of Toronto in September 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago, she oversaw the City of Atlanta's Bikeway Planning, Design and Implementation Group. This summer, Becky and her team were responsible for the rollout of Active TO and the historic acceleration of the cycling network plan in Toronto. Finally, we have Kanchan Maharaj, and she's the senior engineer in the Cycling and Pedestrian Projects Unit. She is responsible for the unit's line making, bollard concrete, uh, bicycle signal, and other uh, related cycling infrastructure contacts, initiatives, and projects. She has over 25 years of Canadian and international engineering, construction, policy, and planning experience in the public and private sector and has volunteered and worked in many equity-seeking organizations in the GTA throughout her career. She has been with the cycling unit for almost seven years, and everyone here who has liked a Twitter pic or an Instagram photo of a, a track curb or a low wall probably owes Kanchen a big thank you. So with that, uh, I'd like to pass it over to our presenters to kick things off and walk us through how uh, bike lanes get built. So Anna, Becky, and Kanchen, uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I'm so thrilled to start. Debbie Mayer, do you want to start with saying some words before I, while I share the screen? Um, I'm actually disabled from screen sharing right now as well. I just want to welcome everybody here and uh, sharing their lunchtime with us. Very excited to, to be here to have this conversation and, uh, and being joined by uh, the uh, champions that really make it happen, that really deliver on these uh, on these bike lanes um, with all the, uh, the infrastructure and putting it together in our communities. Um, so looking forward to the conversation and uh, looking forward to uh, getting more bike lanes built. Thanks so much. And um, I think uh, we're all really excited to be here today with you to share this presentation. We do have some combined slides to walk through and talk about how projects are built. But what I can share just to kick us off um, is that no project is exactly like other, is like other projects. And every project follows a unique, somewhat unique path. 
But the one thing that is constant is your support and your voice. And um, we're again, so appreciative of you being here today and for all the years and time that we know that you put into um, advocating for safer streets, uh, for multimodal projects um, and for your communities. And without that, um, Kanchen and I in transportation services couldn't do our work and our work wouldn't be as strong or as responsive to community context without you. So let's start there. Um, so I'm going to walk us through a, a presentation to start um, with with um, guidance from Council, uh, from Deputy Mayor Bailao. So I think it's really important first to contextualize a bit about our bureaucracy um, and transportation services is a very large organization um, that has many different groups that work on different components. So depending on where your passions are or what challenges you see, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the team that I oversee and the work that Kanchen and I work on is necessarily the right group. You are always welcome to contact us, always welcome to uh, point you in the right direction, but we're not the group alone working on cycling policy, cycling planning, development review. There's many different groups that make up that. So here's just um, the highlights of uh, the main groups in transportation services. There's general manager's office, there's a policy group, um, the capital planning, uh, the planning and capital delivery group, um, project design and management, which we'll talk a little bit more about, business performance that helps us with procurement, operations and maintenance that oversees winter service, traffic management and permits and enforcement. So we're a really large organization. And if you ever have questions about how we function as an organization, I'm always happy to share more. So specifically, the Cycling and Pedestrian Projects Group is in project design and management. And we are four groups within project design and management, neighborhood projects that work on small scale but very impactful projects, um, such as local road reconstructions that include raised crossings and bulb outs or um, some of the community housing redevelopment street networks and a variety of other wonderful and meaningful works. Um, or if you live in Ward 9, uh, you may be familiar with the College Dundas um, intersection change. So that was led partially by neighborhood projects, um, including the short closure of the St. Helens um, street. Um, then there's the Vision Zero projects. They work on safety focus um, reconfigurations of intersections and other um, linear work. And then there's major projects. So if you've been tracking the Young Tomorrow work or the Reimagine Young work or any of the really large projects that require an environmental assessment, that's the team that works on it. And as you know, um, or if you've followed some of those projects, that often includes multimodal improvements, including cycling. So what does, what's remaining for the Cycling and Pedestrian Projects Group is that our key functions are really to deliver near-term cycling network plan projects. And we oversee um, you know, the installs of bike lanes, cycle tracks, intersection improvements, new sidewalks where no sidewalks exist today, and lots of multi-use trails. And we oversee the design, consultation, and implementation of those works. So I just, uh, this is just a further, um, you know, we know I, I receive um, lots of uh, emails and, and great feedback about a whole slew of things that transportation services does. But as I've uh, highlighted, we're not, my team is not the sole team that works on cycling, which is great because that means that there is multimodal capacity across transportation services um, and not just on our team. I should highlight that our team is right now at fully staffed 20 staff members. Um, and so that definitely for how big our city is, is a shared responsibility. So here's just some some major highlights of other groups and what they work on. We know right now, for example, winter service may be on your minds. Um, and again, that would be done by a different group, but we're always, again, happy to connect you with those players and to have those discussions. But we work really closely with counselors' offices, so I thought it would be good to hand it over to Deputy Mayor to talk a little bit about how counselors' offices are organized. Thank you, Becky. And. Um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, 
counselors' offices uh, operate independently and very differently. So counselors are given a budget and the way that they organize or staff uh, their offices is very much um, uh, according to, to the counselor uh, and to the needs of the community. I think each, each of us, each of the 25 counselors, uh, especially now with the bigger wards, uh, we were all adapting to the new reality. Um, but it's very common to have um, people responsible for certain files, people resp responsible for certain geographic areas. Um, and, and like I said, with the area being so big, um, I'm seeing more and more across the offices that, uh, that this is the case. So when you're advocating, when you're talking to a counselor's office and you're interested in cycling infrastructure, um, there's definitely some things that you should find out and ask. Do you have somebody in charge of cycling projects? Do you have somebody in charge of transportation issues? If it is uh, something that is very neighborhood focused, some, some issue, you know, is, is if they don't have a transportation or cycling, is it somebody in a specific neighborhood that you can talk to as well? Uh, they tend to be to have a lot of information um, as well. So, for example, in our office, we do have people that work on uh, um, area specific issues, but uh, transportation and cycling are major issues in our work. We have a lot of work. We meet regularly with transportation staff and, and including uh, our cycling uh, group to make sure that the projects are on track, to make sure that we give them feedback on what we're hearing from the community, to make sure, you know, we are in their radar and, and keep, tr keep track of what's happening. And so we do have um, uh, Adrian Martins. He has the cycling file and, uh, and he works very closely with uh, Michael uh, Jacobi that has also the transportation file. This is actually a, a recent change that we had in our, uh, in our um, office just because the transportation volume was so much that at the beginning we thought, no, we'll, we'll have this as part of the regional areas. But we really thought it was important actually to change that a bit. And recently we've, uh, we've added specifically that deals with uh, transportations, uh, transportation issues in, in our office. Thanks, Councillor. Um, let me see if I can. So let's talk. Um, so uh, Deputy Mayor and I are gonna talk about how bikeways are programmed and approved. And then we're gonna pa pass it off to Kan Chen, who is the senior engineer on our team to talk really about how do we physically build and what are the tools in our toolbox to physically build the infrastructure, both very, all of these very important components. So I've used uh, this slide last year in my presentation to it. Um, I, I always mean to continue to refine it, um, but I've tried to create an illustrative guide in how cycling projects get built. But as I've mentioned before, no project is alike. So um, the number one step is that a project has to be programmed. So a project with defined limits on a defined road has to be programmed. We do that through the cycling network plan and I'll talk more about that. Yeah. Once a project is identified, like the Bloor West Bikeway from Shaw to Runnymede, we then have internal meetings where we have a kickoff, we do data collection, we uh, uh, talk with our other partners who are impacted by projects like this, like TTC, um, you know, the BIA office and a variety, all internal. And then we'll actually go to the counselor's offices and say, here's the information we have today. Here's kind of our gut assumptions. Um, who should we talk to? What's, what's the next steps for you? What are your thoughts? And then we start to think about stakeholder engagement. So then, then we'd go back to the drawing board after we've received some counselor feedback, come up with design ideas, design options, you know, refine our concept and our limits. Um, and then we would have some typically one-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings, maybe BIA groups, maybe residents associations, um, maybe a group of advocates who have been very passionate about the project and have a lot of feedback. Um, and then this whole time we would keep a project update, um, updates and those regular kind of public notices that you may have received. And then we get to work on more formalizing of the design and then coming back to the public to have some sort of large 
consultation process, which we'll also talk more about. And that's really step number two. It's like it's programmed. We've initially done the vetting. And then number two is let's talk about it in the public forum. Um, and of course, with COVID, how we do that has greatly changed in a very short period of time and has uh, created new barriers and challenges to talk through. Um, then we would take all that feedback back and we would evaluate, we would redesign, we would respond, and we would probably go back to the counselor to talk through what has changed, what we've heard, um, and provide updates to the public. Once we've settled on a final design, our team would author a council report, which would go to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee, which it then would include all of the design recommendations, um, including the actual physical bylaws that are used to enact a project. At that point, we would hand it over to council to have that discussion to whether or not they agree with the recommendations. And then finally, we'd get to Canchin's part where it would be constructed and everyone can celebrate and we can cut a ribbon. So we're actually going to talk about each of these steps in depth. So programming, consultation, council reporting, and construction. So programming is really hinged on the cycling network plan. I think since I've joined in September 2019, I've only lived in the city of Toronto with the reality of the 2019 cycling network plan. I know that there's been previous plans such as the 10 year 20, uh, 2016 plan. Um, what I really love about the cycling network plan is its individual components and its accountability. So, um, it includes basically three major pieces. Um, one is a short-term, near-term project list and plan that says these are the projects that we are going to do in three years from 2019 to 2021. Um, this year, there'll actually be a process to adopt through City Council a new near-term plan. So that'd be a great time for all of you to be involved and to comment. But there's also, of course, long-term visioning um, and so the long-term visioning is this map. And so instead of having a route map, which is very traditional bike planning, rather we ranked all of the corridors that everyone has suggested in the past for suitability. And this included an equity analysis, a safety analysis, potential and future demand. And what this map says, besides looking like a whole lot of sprinkles, um, is that there are so many routes in the city that are valuable for cycling. It's not that just one street is valuable for cycling, but certain streets have higher suitability. So this is our long-term visioning. In conjunction with that long-term visioning, there's something called the major citywide corridors, which is this map here. I think you'll all probably be familiar with many of these streets. Um, and this is to say, this is the highest priority street. So if there is any road program projects um, uh, programmed on these corridors, or if we can accelerate a near term quicker build project, these are the corridors to focus on. And I think it's really important to have this type of, and I think this really came out of some of the discussions from Councilor of high, high priority routes and the minimum grid conversations that happen in the advocacy community. But there's also, again, a near-term program, which is much more aligned with our capital delivery. I think there was a lot of learnings from the 2016 plan that planning projects over a 10-year timeline is too volatile. Things change too much. Um, horrible, you know, just like we'll have collisions that happen, and thus we need to respond and act swifter. Projects get deferred because of private development. So a three-year near-term plan really works. So this is an example of the um, near-term plan in um, um, Deputy Mayor's ward. And here are some quick projects that are, or some, the short list of projects that are actually coming up for delivery. And I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Deputy Mayor, if you'd like to add anything about this near-term program. Thank you, thank you, Becky. Uh, so first, I think I should um, have a disclaimer that um, <laughs> my feedback to you and um, my advice here today is um, from the point where I come from, from where I look at this. And I am a counselor that looks at um, cycling infrastructure as um, how do we get it done? This is not an option. This is about 
uh, moving people in a safe way in the city with all kinds of different options. The same way we look at TTC, the same way that we look at um, different modes of transportation, cycling is an integral part of mobility in the city. So when staff comes to me and says, the, you know, this is uh, the, the projects we're looking at uh, this year, obviously I uh, take the feedback that you know, groups like the Ward 9 Cycling uh, Committee, things that I hear in the community as well, but also what I know in the community to make it happen. So for example, when we were talking about the Bloor bike lanes, um, I knew that there were gonna be issues that we were gonna have to solve. So the discussion was not, are we gonna expand the Bloor bike lane or not? The issue is how do we get it done? So th that responds to uh, the issues that there are in the community. We had a, a seniors residence that needs needs you know uh, drop off and, and and pick off with emergency vehicles. We had a center for people with disabilities. How do we integrate that? So making sure that I alert uh, the staff for these issues, making sure that these people are uh, brought up to the consultation. Because let me tell you, in every project, we're always accused of not having enough consultation. Uh, if you were hearing to council yesterday, we didn't have enough consultation yet for you know, uh, young tomorrow, even though there, there's been, you know, I don't know how many meetings are, uh, already that the local councilor and all kinds of organizations has, has had on this issue. So how do we prepare for that to make sure that those issues are brought to the table, that we tackle, that we don't take for granted the issues that people bring to our attention, but actually we address them uh, right on and, and um, bring that as, um, as a solution. Also, obviously, you know, when these projects come in, there's also the uh, healthy um, pressure of saying, okay, how can I get this done sooner? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, um, you know, there's, uh, there's also that, uh, that, that pressure that the, you know, sometimes it results in motions uh, to ask staff to do things quicker, uh, sometimes be because the pressure and the need in communities, and especially, for example, in Ward 9, which is a community that has, you know, a lot of people that cycle. And so for me, ensuring that we have the network done in a safe way as quickly as possible is really important. So we're always looking to see how can we support staff as well to have this done um, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in a quicker way. So making sure that they have the right stakeholders at the table, making sure we give them heads up about what we've been listening to uh, from the cycling community, but also from the community in general, and then making sure that they have the resources to deliver on that. So that's that's usually the issues that we talk about in that first initial meeting that we have at the beginning of it every year where they come with the projects and we tell them not good enough. <laughs> I, I can share that that is how many of our council meetings go when we're talking about the programming which is how can you do more or how can you do this and it is uh, again a negotiation and um, a great segue into the consultation. So, uh, yes. of course, there's consultation about, you know, what projects should be programmed, but when a project is programmed, then there's specific consultation on the project. And we do try and scale consultation to the scale of the type of project. So something like a contraflow bike lane um, in a neighborhood that has very little impact, we'll try and scale the consultation to conserve resources, whereas something like Bloor, um, you know, we'll scale up the consultation and we'll do much more stakeholder outreach, um, have a uh, stakeholder committee, um, and et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, there's so many different methods of consultation, but I think the main point um, that we always try and do is to pull out feedback. And I think I really loved what Deputy Mayor said about um, it's really great to work in Ward 9 because we can start from the base of, you know, is there, not if there should be a bikeway, but how the bikeway is going to work with all the, um, you know, adjacent property owners and uh, traffic challenges within the community. I would say that that's not always where we start. Um, sometimes it is a discussion um, with the community about if a bikeway should be. And so we do have to pivot our consultation from a staff side of where people are, you know, 
what value there is. Um, we always see value in the projects that we move forward. Um, but, you know, I think probably everyone, if you're on this call, perhaps you have participated in consultation before, virtual briefings, uh, counselor meetings. Um, but we're really trying to pull out feedback. So I'd highly encourage all of you um, when you participate in these to hone in on, you know, what is the project? You know, what are you hoping to see from it? Because we really get a lot. And I, I often hear this critique about, oh, can't you just not do consultation? It will be faster. But the challenge with that for our side is that we get so many good ideas and we're pushed further to do more progressive designs when we do consultation. So I know there's a lot of talk about the naysayers and you know, uh, you're just trying to appease them. But to be honest, for us, we just get such great feedback when you get through some of that stuff. And so that's why we continue to do consultation and hinge our work um, on, on those conversations with the community. Yeah, if I could just add on, on that point, and, and we have examples uh, that we've been working on recently, for example, with the West Toronto Rail Path, the connections, I mean, staff are, are great, but the, the expertise that come from people that use these paths, these neighborhoods, these uh, at, on a daily basis, it adds uh, another level of expertise that is uh, irreplaceable. And so when we start talking to residents and they say, well, we use this way, maybe it would be great to have a connection here. It would be great to have a traffic light here. The, this is really important information because it's gonna be making the routes a lot safer. It'll, it'll, it'll be making more usable for people for, and, and because those are the patterns. And we know that sometimes it's tough to change how people move around if they're used to use, uh, use those routes in a certain way. And so this is really, really valuable information. The other thing is in terms of consultation, um, I think that for example, the, uh, and, and the, the Bloor uh, bike lanes, I mean, there's been a ton of advocacy for many, many years and there was a lot of information and the benefit that we had to have uh, a lot of knowledge and metrics from the pilot project. So, uh, but I think that um, it's, it was really important to do the advocacy, for example, with the business groups and, and, and even coming from uh, other neighbors, um, uh, it is important to also having neighbors talking to neighbors, not sometimes not even, you know, the, the, the city staff or myself, but when they hear other neighbors saying, you know what, I take my kids to school, I want to be able to do it in a safe way. And this is what it means. And, and having that, uh, that dialogue, uh, that it, I, it is really important. And, and I, I consider that as part of the consultation that we reach out to all kinds of different uh, stakeholders. Uh, because the, these, again, these are solutions that are not only about the person that rides the bike, it's about how you move people around in a safe way in our neighborhoods. And so different stakeholders need to be involved and need to be part of, of that conversation. And they need to see that it's a benefit for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just love that feedback about how, you know, we are experts in cycling design and pedestrian design, but we are not all experts in your community. And that's why we need you and why we need to do consultation. And I, I love the West Toronto Rail Path example because, um, you know, Deputy Mayor has been, uh, uh, excuse this term, but a bulldog to ensure that, you know, there's a connection near the no frills, for example. And, uh, you know, in our original scoping, that would not have been included if we didn't hear from Deputy Mayor and from her community. And it has become like, I'm so excited for when that happens because it, it just shows how consultation and feedback changes it also for the positive. I think again, I don't want people to be left with the impression that consultation um, leaves things always in the negative. It doesn't, it, it really improves, um, it can improve a project, so. If I could just add one more thing on consultation, which is, the challenge that this year we're having with all kinds of consultation, not only on cycling, but on everything. And uh, we need to realize and acknowledge that the fact that we are only online uh, makes it really hard to have equitable consultation. That there's a lot of people that don't have access, don't know how to have access to uh, uh, these meetings. Sometimes there's already language barriers and this is an additional barrier. So. I think we need to be conscious of that, be careful with that, acknowledge that, uh, especially through these projects this year. This is something that we're 
thinking about, for example, in my office, how do we start doing notices in all kinds of different languages? We have to go above and beyond this year just because we're not going to be able to have in-person meetings in some of these uh, in, in some of these projects. And that is really important. And I think we we can't just brush it to the side. We need to acknowledge that and, and respond to that new reality. Yeah, and absolutely. And we we too are um, you know trying to review our best practices and, and lean on other municipalities and, and other nonprofits and how they're doing it. But again, another place that you know if you ever have thoughts or um, you know innovative ideas, that's stuff that we love to hear about. So just, uh, we'll, we'll uh, Deputy Mayor and I will round out with just talking about, okay, so we've gotten through the programming, we've gotten through the consultation and we have this design that maybe there's not full consensus, but it is our best recommendations. Um, our team would then author this holy grail of a report, uh, which would go to infrastructure environment committee and then to council. And then the council, uh, would have a debate, uh, potentially add um, a addenda or motions to ch slightly change our recommendations or to expand on our recommendations. And then a project would be adopted and we would move to construction. Now, that's my summary because that's what I do is I write the report with the support of my colleagues and I send it in and then we answer questions, but I'll leave it to the deputy mayor to talk about the council process a bit more. So yes, we do have these reports and usually, um, especially when it's more local stuff, like we had the Bloor bike lanes or transform uh, uh, young, young tomorrow, like we had yesterday, the local council is highly, highly involved. And especially if they're supportive, of course, uh, but uh, it is crucial uh, to move these big projects to have the support of, a, of of the local councilor. Um, it is, uh, I mean, with the Bloor bike lanes, we were able to expedite that. We had already uh, um, done that even pre-COVID because uh, Councillor Layton, myself and Councillor Perks were all on the same page. And this was a high priority for all of us. So we really pushed hard to, to have this um, uh, expedited and installed a lot quicker. Um, but these projects then go to council and it is, really important to have uh, the local councillors advocating uh, for them with their colleagues as well. So there's a lot of work that needs to get done. Uh, there's a lot of uh, advocacy that gets done outside council that impacts council votes as well. All the, uh, you know, uh, community groups, the um, uh, city builders, uh, urbanists uh, in the city, um, uh, organizations, nonprofit organization. It is really important to engage different stake stakeholders uh, to, to be public uh, about their uh, support for, uh, for the, these initiatives. It does make it um, easier to have uh, the project uh, getting approved at council. Um, I think there's um, there are um, counselors that uh, have a really hard time supporting cycling infrastructure. <laughs> um, I think I'm being super diplomatic, <laughs> um, and and so, uh, but uh, there are counselors that um, we can we can work with, and when they understand that the local community. Uh, has is on side then when stakeholders have been consulted and and they're you know on side I, I think and anybody in politics understands that you can never please 100 percent everybody right so I think you know every politician needs to to understand that and but when when counselors understand that the homework has been done things have been taken consideration overall there's uh their support um that's uh usually how uh things get to to the numbers uh to, to get, get it passed and sometimes with overwhelming uh, support uh, like it happened yesterday. So um, the, the role of the, the local council, but the, the civic involvement of organizations like Cycle Toronto, uh, from petitions to um, meetings, to calling and emails, emails to uh, the councillors are a key uh, component to make sure that these things get approved at council. Yeah, and just uh, one last comment that I have before we hand it over to Kanchen to talk about how we actually physically build bikeways is that 
I, you know, I've only been here since 2019, since September, but I, from what I've heard from all of you and the stories that people have shared is that the city really has evolved a lot um, and city council has evolved quite a lot in the past 10 years. And it is just amazing to me, the level of support there is for cycling that has not traditionally, or, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps not, was not in place. And that is because of the work that all of you have done. And, and I know that change takes a long time. It can be very frustrating advocacy. Um, you know, it, it can be really challenging, but it is the hard work and dedication that has changed hearts and minds on all sides, on counselors, on individual counselors who have championed projects, on city staff who've fulfilled those commitments to those projects, and for all of you for um, pushing and advocating, emailing us, whether the counselor's offices or our offices, and continuing that push. And that collection has evolved to where we are today. If you watch the Young Tomorrow vote or the Bloor bikeway vote, um, of course, there's some level of debate, but but generally just so aligned with Vision Zero principles and, and the policies that City Council has adopted. And it's really, truly an honor to work here. Um, I came from a much more suburban city that had a lot more hesitation towards cycling infrastructure. And it's, it's really been an opportunity of my lifetime, of my career to, to work in this environment where I feel supported by advocates um, and by counselors and where actually we're, we have uh, challenges meeting the demand, not uh, you know trying to figure out where we have demand, which was much more common in Atlanta, where we were looking for projects that we could get done. Um, whereas here, it's like sometimes I feel like <laughs> drowning. <laughs> I get out of a meeting with Deputy Mayor, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? She wants more, and it's so great, and I want to fulfill it, but you know, getting getting the capacity to do that takes time. Yeah. So yeah. It, uh, just one final comment, Becky, because I yesterday was Councillor Fillion that was actually just reminding all of us when we were in council of, you know, what we've done, actually, for example, this term, we've approved Transform Young, Young Tomorrow, in, I installed Bloor bike lanes, univer, uh, the university, it's been, it's been significant. And, and I think um, uh, we've turned the corner and this is transformational. And uh, I think we just need, need to keep going this way. Agreed, but there's no way to fulfill that if we don't actually build them. So with that, I will pass it over to Kanchen. And, and, and Kanchen, I'll, you can just give me the indication whenever you want me to change the slide. All right, uh, there we go. All right, uh, thanks, Becky. So as uh, Michael mentioned in the introduction, I'm the senior engineer in the Cycling Pedestrian Projects Unit, and I'm responsible for our delivery contracts. So things like line marking, bollards and dividers, all the concrete that you see out there, some of the bicycle signals, as well as managing our drafting staff. And I manage a couple projects every year as well. And my background is both in planning and engineering, but mostly in transportation. Um, I've also worked for utilities, construction, the TTC and traffic management. So there's a, I look at all of our projects with a very wide lens and try and um, make sure that we're considering all the different factors when we build things and design things. There's a lot of material to cover here, and I'm going to just try to give a general overview of as many things as I can. And just to provide a better understanding of the design and installation process of some and some of the challenges that we have. I'm also going to try to focus just on the project that we construct ourselves. And we also, I'll talk about this closer to the end, but we also have different partners for larger reconstruction projects, uh, such as the Engineer Construction Services Division of the City, uh, TRCA, Metrolinx, and anything that's bigger than just line marking or bollards or concrete that we can do ourselves. So things like uh, Bloor between Spadina and Bathurst or Shooter Street last year or the College Dundas intersection last year, those were all done with uh, ECS or other partners like TTC as well for College Dundas. But many of the things I'm gonna talk about now apply to all of those types of projects as well. And, and while I'm also focusing on cycling infra infrastructure, we are the Cycling Pedestrian Projects Unit. And our team's goal is always to try and design and build the safest in infrastructure for all road users. So this slide here uh, looks at some of the design processes and constraints and guidelines that we use. 
there's a lot of standards that we use to determine what we can fit on any roadway or corridor. So we look at things like the vehicle speeds and volumes, the types of vehicles that use the road, turning radii, lane widths, driveways, drainage, snow clearing, even maintenance and grades and the sight lines. But no matter what we build, we still have to maintain the minimum widths and radii. On the bottom right, there are some of the different uh, lane widths that we use to design roadways based on what the travel volumes are. And in the middle are the different vehicle sizes. So the minimum that we need for most roads is 3.3 to 3.5 meters, depending on what kind of vehicles use that road. And those different types of vehicles have different paths when they take turns. So the, the vehicle on the left, or sorry, the image on the left shows the Ellis and Lakeshore intersection where we installed a bike lane last year. And we also closed that right turn channel to make it safer for all the road users. And some of the feedback that we got before we did this was that, well, how are, how are WV20s, which are tractor trailers, going to make this turn if you close that channel? And um, if you can see in that image there, they never made that turn. Uh, trucks were never using this route and we didn't make anything worse by closing that channel. We actually made it safer for all the road users because they're not using this. They're actually using Windermere to get onto to Lakeshore. And this is also why when we design the intersections, we can't run the barriers right up to the intersection because we've still got to leave space for different vehicles <coughs> to, make, to make the turns and to get as close as they can so they can fit in the receiving lane as well. And that's why you often sometimes see that uh, stop bars are placed in different areas, different locations. Sometimes the, the cycling stop bar is ahead of the vehicle stop bar because of the different radiars. And I'll, I'll have pictures on that on some further slides as well. But it's so that we can still accommodate all of these, these different types of vehicles under the contracts that we manage. And sometimes we build them out and we build them out with curbs and bollards to where they should be and we wait for a reconstruction or resurfacing where we can permanently move the curb line, but we don't have the base capacity in our own group to move curbs. So we do whatever we can with paint, bollards, and concrete until um, the road can be reconstructed and we can actually do um, something more permanent and more robust. If you go to the next slide now, I'm gonna talk about some of the materials that we use to build our projects. The two most frequent things that you'll see out there right now are line markings, so paint and bollards. Line marking usually happens at nights when the traffic volumes are the lowest, and we use three main types of materials, two main types now. So cold plastic are the white and yellow lines that you see out there, and uh, reflective beads are added on top. Thermoplastic is uh, the solid green area markings, as well as the decorative markings that were on the Danforth, and that has the embedded grit on top and uh, reflective beads embedded into the plastic. We also used MMAX uh, for a little while in 2018 when there was a, uh, an industry shortage of thermoplastic and we couldn't get it. We're not gonna use that uh, going forward if possible. It's, um, it's not suitable. The, the red bike lane, the, sorry, the red bus lanes are MMAX. They, they are very uh, smelly, which is okay if you're in a bus. It's not so good if you're driving um, and they off gas and they need perfect uh, conditions to install it. And we try to stretch our season, season as long as possible, and it's just not practical for what we do. Our painting season is approximately April to November, and sometimes we push that uh, as long as we can. Uh, we, all, we can install thermoplastic year round, but it's also dependent on how much snow is on the ground and if it's safe to even do so. So some of the types of markings we do, we do the green uh, bus stop markings. We've been doing green intersection markings. Um, the uh, inset bike boxes, uh, any conflict area is also marked in green. We've also been changing the, the bike lanes lines at intersections from dashed lines to solid lines to make sure there's a clear delineation because there's always been some confusion about should the bike and the cars, where should the car be to make the right turn? Should it be in the bike lane? And if it's a dashed line, um, there's a lot of confusion there. And so now we're trying to make that as clear as possible. We did Davenport last year and we'll be doing a different corridor, at least one corridor every year going forward. So bollards are the other things that you see a lot of. Before 2018, we only used the round bollards because they were the best thing available. They were rated for 50 hits up to 50 miles an hour. But just looking around the city, you can tell that they get hit a lot. And we have a very high bollard fatality rate is what I like to call it. We've been replacing those bollards with a different kind of flat bollard starting last year. The first time we used them was on the Bloor Viaduct in 2017, just to test them out. 
and we were the first municipality in North America outside of Quebec to use them and when we used them in 2017. Now they've become a standard across most of Canada at least and they're starting to come into the United States now. And they're a flat fiberglass bollard with a rubber base and permanent hardware in the road. They also allow us to, to be, they also allow us to install um, these bollards into concrete curbs, which we can't do with the round bollards because the hardware is different. And while the round bollards are, are really quick to install, the flat bollards are not because of the permanent hardware in the road. We actually have to come back twice to do it, once to install the hardware in the road, then the next day to install the, the bollard on top of the hardware into the road. So we still use the round bollards for quick installations, but the flat bollards are for more permanent installations and with the curbs. We also get a lot of questions about the colors. Why white and yellow? Our guidelines for the city is that um, we use white on white lines, yellow on dull lines. So with the Highway Traffic Act, yellow separates different directions of traffic and white separates the same direction of traffic. And that's what we've used for the city so far. I'm gonna talk about concrete. We started using concrete heavily last year. Before that, we didn't really have a lot of concrete in the city, except when we did reconstructions uh, where the whole road was redone. Whatever we do or build in concrete has to fit within the painted buffer. And the reasons for that are, are multifold. The, the, the width of the bike lane and the width of the travel lanes are measured from the center of the line. So we can't infringe on that line. And the, also the, rhyme, the lines are reflective, the bollards and sorry, the concrete is not reflective. We add reflective strips onto the concrete, but the lines need to be fully visible and we need to maintain space for things like pedal strike and other, and debris and windrows, which is the snow that's cleared and the plow goes through. So the buffers have to, the buffer lines have to be fully visible. The plows and the sweepers also have to, also have to get through and we measure those widths to the center of the line. So the line, um, the line determines what we can actually fit in, in the buffers. So we started the curbs in 2020 and we tried a whole bunch of different configurations because it was the first time we used it. Thousands were installed. Um, we've got 48,000 of these, sorry, 4,800 of the custom curbs. We've got about 2,000 of the active fuel curbs plus a different type of curb on Danforth. The ones that we use, uh, the custom ones, were made for the city um, with all the rebar at the bottom. Typically with a curb, you've got rebar at the top and the bottom. We didn't want any at the top so that we could install the bollards into the top of the curbs. So all the curbs that you see out there on um, Woodbine and not Danforth, but Bloor, um, River Street, they're all the custom curbs and that's what we will be, be our standard going forward. We're also one of the first to use those custom curbs in Ontario. We also put the, the bollards at the ends of the curbs to delineate where the gaps are. We consulted with Solid Waste um, who asked for these gaps so that they could drag the bins out if they needed to. They're also for drainage and to just so that if there's a windrow along this covering the curbs, pedestrians will be able to tell where the gaps are because between the small gap bollard gaps is where there's a gap and there's no curb. So that if you need to, to walk between them and you can't see the curb, you'll be able to tell that the small gaps are for the bollards. We're still trying many different uh, spacings out just to try and we tried probably at least three or four different ones this year to try and figure out what works best as we try and develop our guidelines and what to use. And contra contrary to what you might have seen on social media, um, these are not designed to be driven over. The ballers are not supposed to be driven over. The curbs are not supposed to be driven over. They're supposed to be done um, waste pickup from curbside. The other thing that we use are um, our walls. So the walls were just, they were first used on the Lakeshore cycle track in 2017 to 2018 on Lakeshore Boulevard. In 2020, we installed them on Shoreham, Scarlet, Richmond, Adelaide, Harvard, um, sorry, Conlins. So Conlins, those first five were the ones that were programmed for 2020. We had some left over from Richmond and Adelaide because of the work zones on Richmond and Adelaide, and we couldn't install them. Those gaps will be filled in this year. But with the leftover curbs, we were able to do Harvard, Lansdowne, and Runnymede. Um, Ellis was just uh, a couple of walls to, um, to block the channel. But these walls are substantial. And the reason we use these custom walls is because a normal Jersey barrier has too wide of a footprint to fit within our buffers. Uh, typically, a Jersey barrier is at least 800 millimeters wide. The walls that we're using are 450. So we can install more walls because they fully fit in most of our, most of our buffers. So with a 450 wall, we can get them up to a minimum 
The minimum width we're gonna use is about 60 centimeter buffer width to get a wall in. Curbs are 200 millimeters wide, so we can get them into about a 40, 40 to 45 centimeter buffer. So we don't use them where the posted speed is above 50 kilometers an hour. Um, there we would want a Jersey variant more robust protection. They weigh 760 kilograms. So when you see them moved, it takes quite an impact to move them. Um, we don't pin them to the road yet, um, but we are looking at different, different configurations and we have to do a structural analysis every time we put them on bridges as well because they are so substantial. So just to uh, talk about the art as well, uh, with Lakeshore Boulevard, we started a partnership with Street Art where we hired artists to, do, uh, to cover all of the, the barriers in art. So Lakeshore was first in 2018. We did it twice in 17 and 18 as we were figuring out how to do this. We've had a lot of other cities and uh, municipalities contact us from all over the world to ask us how we are doing this. Um, we've fine tuned the way uh, that the paint gets applied to the concrete so that it sticks. That's why Lakeshore had to be done twice. Uh, the, first, the first method we tried didn't work. Uh, this year, sorry, last year we did Shoreham and Scarlet. Uh, almost 200 artists were employed to do the, the art on Shoreham and Scarlet. In 2021, we'll be doing Richmond, Adelaide, and Conlins. And in 2022, the potential is to do Lansdowne and Runnymede with the walls that we installed at the last part of uh, 2020 when the, those underpasses are also done. So the, the last thing I'm going to talk about is something I've touched on earlier, which is road constructions, reconstructions. And that's really our opportunity to do something substantial where we can go and we can uh, partner with ECS or Metrolinx or TRC or whoever's doing a major reconstruction project. And we can build something substantial where we can replace the temporary curbs with, with permanent curbs and build the road and rebuild the roads and the sidewalks and the cycle tracks properly. Something like what you saw on um, Floor Street between Bathurst and Spadina, where we did the pilot project, we had the bollards out there, and then we replaced it. Something similar will be happening between Spadina and University as well, where we have the protected intersection and where we can build something um, substantial. But projects like that require a lot of um, planning and capital coordination, where we always want to be the last people in. We don't want to go in and then the water main or the road needs to be replaced the next year. We want all of that to be done. And then when the road gets done, we partner with whoever is doing the road reconstruction, typically ECS, and we put our stuff in with their project and we do it all at the same time. Um, that's the end of my summary. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't touch on, touch on like transit platforms and signage and wayfinding and signals. But hopefully if you have questions about those sorts of things, I can answer it in the Q&A. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Becky. Uh, thanks, Kanchin. And thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor Barlow, for the uh, presentation. Um, we do have, uh, I think, hopefully that was really informative uh, for a lot of people. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is uh, very passionate about uh, cycling and improving infrastructure across our city, and hopefully people learned a lot. Um, I just want to start, uh, before we get into the Q&A, uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to just take a moment uh, to reflect on how we engage with one another. And please remember to engage with respect and intent, uh, not only with our speakers, but also with each other uh, in the chat box. Uh, Cycle Toronto does not tolerate racism, xenophobia, homophobia, um, ableism, ageism, or any kind of any other kind of discrimination. And please remember not to discredit the lived experience of marginalized communities who are members of our community and our city alike, uh, like everyone else. So if you have a question, uh, put it in the, the chat box. We'll uh, try to get to as many of them um, as we can. Um, uh, and I'll just sort of uh, start um, right away with the first question uh, we received. Um, uh, what would you characterize as the biggest factor in either approving or declining any particular cycling project? Mm -hmm. And I guess as a follow-up, um, based on this, are there different stages where disapproval or, or uh, declining could happen, whether at programming consultation or at committee council. So maybe with the first part, we'll ask Becky. 
Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was thinking oh, sure. it was a, a deputy mayor question. I was like, oh, council. <laughs> I, I, I'm, well, we can get to the council part, but even yeah. just sort of maybe before it gets to council, uh, biggest yeah. factor in approving or declining uh, any particular second project, maybe either at a programming stage or a consultation stage. Yeah, I, I think from a, a programming perspective, it's really what um, Kanchen highlighted, which is what's the scope and what is what needs to be coordinated. So, um, you know, we get lots of requests for projects that require full reconstruction or, um, you know, in boulevard trails and these types of things. So it's not that we would necessarily decline it, but that we would have to say that's a great project, but can't be, um, can't occur right now um, and would need to be programmed appropriately. Um, I also think it, it, you know, we do have prioritization processes. So something that maybe is local to your community that might be a really high priority for your community, uh, totally support, you should always send those in. But sometimes you'll get no's from us when it's like, look, our, our program is full. We have a, you know, citywide um, scope and we do work with limited resources and thus, you know, right now, uh, given what we've committed to um, our equity lens, our safety prioritization lens, this is not falling to the top of the prioritization. So we'll, you know, track those requests, but can't move forward, at least from our side. Um, I have yet to be involved in something that has moved into consultation that then has been, um, completely taken off the table. So typically by the time we get into that public consultation, um, it, it does become a real project. How long it takes to get to the approval and construction stage, stage does change, but I, I have yet to be involved in my short time here in something that just gets totally nixed. So that's great, <laughs> that's great news. <laughs> But I would say that it, it, it could happen. And yes. that's why consultation and the advocacy role is so important. Um, I think that having that analysis from staff and the programming and saying, listen, this is part of our plan. We really wanna do this. The, the, the background on the programming is really important. Um, but after that, it, you know, it, it, it could happen. Um, the consultation uh, part of it is really important, especially if the discussion is, starting as should we have it or not have it, right? So that is when, when it is really important at that point in time um, to have that, uh, that advocacy uh, work done and also the, the work from, from staff to back that up on the need to have it done. Um, and, and, and how does it fit in with the cycling network plan and that equity lens of uh, bringing cycling across the city as well. Michael, you're on mute, so we can't hear the question. <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, I was like, oh, great, we're absolved. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> muted myself. Uh, thank you. And I guess just to follow up to that then, um, uh, Anna, in terms of the approving or declining uh, by the time it gets to council, do you have any particular insight uh, in terms of uh, what factors you've seen and what's a successful project that passes? Uh, like, like we said, you know, uh, support from the local local counselor, uh, really strong advocacy. The, so the, the, how it is, you know, the background work that was done by staff, how it is presented um, and, uh, and the different stakeholders. Uh, there's gonna be issues all the time. And like I said, it, people in politics understand that there's always gonna be some issues that you bring forward, but uh, can we tackle, have we tackled um, most of, of these issues? I think that's what guarantees that we can have the um, the momentum, that momentum growing. You know, we know that we need those 13 votes, but um, I, I think it feels really good when that momentum is able to be built and things get approved with, you know, over 20 votes and the majority and, and council really embraces. So it's how to create that momentum. Uh, thanks. And I, I guess just over your time at council, just as a follow-up, are you seeing a, I mean, maybe we're seeing a change in that momentum. Is, is that something you're seeing as well? Um, I am seeing, but it's, it, it, is, it also depends on uh, the communities. And that's why it is so important that we start having projects. And I think that um, 
city staff tries to have projects across the city, obviously for equity reasons, because we have cyclists and people that cycle across the city, but it's also important to start having more and more of these uh, dialogues with uh, communities from across the city that uh, might have not uh, had as many conversations as other communities like the one I have the privilege of representing because we have more people that cycle, we have more projects already that happen, people feel more comfortable, uh, people see some of the benefits uh, of, of, of these, this infrastructure. So um, those conversations are all are still very, very, very important. As we've recently seen with something that was installed with ActiveTO and then the, there was a no cry supposedly of, of the community um with those with those bike lanes so we don't want that to happen we want to have um uh, the the conversations and the work done uh to make sure that we move keep moving forward great thank you um another question we have uh, is sort of asking about accessibility and uh the question is are there cyclists with disabilities that are involved with decision making or an advisory committee is there anyone looking through a lived disability lens? Um, I know there was a report uh, about active TO and accessibility that came forward, uh, but uh, Becky, I wonder if you wanna start with that first and maybe we can go to uh, Kanchan and Orana. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. I, I think uh, Kanchan and I can, can talk about how our program has changed. Um, I'll just speak very um, high level on our engagement with the accessibility community. Um, formally, we work with the city of Toronto's accessibility community, which is like a subcommittee of the infrastructure and environment committee. And then we also work with um, the TTC um, accessibility um, committee. These are formal committees that have um, meetings. I actually do not know if anybody on those committees um, cycle or not, um, but they um, have shared many um, great in-depth feedback on how we uh, can Im approve, improve our um, construction projects and our, our, our designs to be more suitable. Um, but I'll pass it over to Kanchan on some of the um, accessibility um, things that we consider in our in our projects. So I briefly talked about uh, things like sight lines and where we um, turning radii and, and making sure that everything we build fits within the roadway and that doesn't um, doesn't infringe upon uh, the, the pedestrian area or the other the cycling area and the, the areas don't cross as best as we can. Um, if anybody's familiar with the Lakeshore cycle track, we had extensive accessibility consultations on that project because we hadn't built anything like it before. So we talked to the city's accessibility committee and we talked to the TTC's accessibility committee because it's it's unique and we still don't have anything like that yet in the city that's that's been built. And typically it's part of the consultation process to try and engage as many communities as possible and get as much feedback as we can before we build something and to, to learn lessons like things that we did on Roncesvalles, we wouldn't do that again. And things that we did on, on different projects that we make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes. And a lot of things that we build in the city um, hasn't been done before. And so we, we learn every time we do and we try and do better every time and talk to more people, engage more communities every time. Yeah, a couple of other just high level notes to make. Uh, we try and avoid at all costs dismount uh, scenarios like on trail crossings. Um, that's clearly a challenge like the, the I call them cattle gates or P gates. If you ride the Don trails, you may be familiar. Um, these can cause challenges for um, accessibility, uh, people who uh, bike and have challenges dismounting or are have, uh, kids on the back of their bikes. Um, we look at bike racks from that lens. Um, this year in the active TO program, we tested out temporary asphalt uh, platforms and uh, Deputy Mayor highlighted some locations on Bloor. Um, that was a permanent project, but we still um, use quick build materials. Um, and so like in front of Sistering and um, New Horizons, which is a senior center, uh, we actually elevated the bikeway uh, so that people could load um, from from the uh, floating parking. So those are definitely some newer improvements that we've looked at. Uh, we have a lot of permanent bus bike platforms. The first ones being on Sherborne and then later on the Lakeshore project, which is a bi-directional bikeway. Um, but I 
the only thing I would like to note to this community is that uh, we need more voices of people who face accessibility challenges. And we really rely on the advocacy community. And I would say my short time here with working with Walk Toronto, they have a really strong accessibility lens and um, group um, that, that participates in their advocacy. So it's a really great resource for us to come and vet ideas before going to other formal committees. Um, and I hope that if you oversee a ward group or another group within your neighborhood, that you are um, that you can help us connect with those community members who face challenges, um, but yet still want to see multimodal projects get um, implemented. That's really important to us. And if you ever have resources or know folks, um, is definitely a lens that we need to continue to improve upon. And our work is never done in that space. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Becky and Kanshin. Um, uh, since we we were a little bit uh, late getting rolling, we'll maybe stick around for a couple minutes and get a few more questions in, if that works for everyone here. Um, um, so there's a question asking about what sort of uh, what sort of transportation data pertaining to cycling, walking, etc. Does the city collect, and what influence does it have on decision making? Um, you sort of pointed out the cycling network plan lots of lines on lots of maps, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of data is uh, sort of feeds into that and then uh, the decisions? Sure, Kanchen, you wanna take how much data we manage or do you want me to start? <laughs> you can start, I can add more if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so there's lot, there's so much data. We have a great, in the policy and innovation team, um, again, sharing a multimodal responsibility in transportation services. We have a data and analytics team um, who is responsible for managing and collecting data. Um, our data collection and analysis processes in the whole world on all subjects has greatly advanced in the past 10 years. I mean, the fact that one of the most, you know, common job professions is data science or, you know, um, a really growing field is just an indicator of what we're trying to keep up with. Um, data that we use is equity-based data, so neighborhood improvement area, census data. Um, we use all the traditional stuff like traffic volumes, operating and um, speed speed data, which we collect through a variety of ways, um, multimodal counts, pedestrian counts, um, cycling counts um, all year, all seasons. Um, uh, we do uh, more, uh, maybe softer is a qualitative analysis. So um, for both Destination Danforth and the major road closures, we did public intercept surveys to get firsthand accounts of how people were experiencing those corridors. I think that's pretty um, important to get, you know, a um, real qualitative analysis of how people are experiencing the street. Um, and same on the Bloor West, um, the first section of the Bloor pilot, you know, we did business surveys, public intercept surveys to, to hear from people. Um, so yeah, qualitative, quantitative data. Um, it definitely informs our work. I would say on a baseline, speed and volume is one of the first things we look to on a street motor vehicle speed and volume to determine what type of bikeway would be appropriate, right? Because something like Shaw Street, um, if you're familiar, uh, it's a local street um, versus something like Bloor are going to have different types of infrastructure and the volume and speed of a roadway um, and collision data, excuse me, volume, speed and collision, I would say, are the first thing we look at um, within our programming and our uh, design and planning. And um, it definitely informs our work and what we think is possible to complete um, currently. Yeah. If I could just make a comment on data, because I think you know data is super important for the kind of uh, bike lane that uh, that we build. But I very often uh, use uh, list here in, in consultations. People saying, "Well, nobody's using it. Nobody's riding these things." Um, in cycling infrastructure, I think there's a big component of making sure that we're creating the routes so people start to thinking of this as as a viable and safe. Mode, mode of transportation. So as a decision maker, yes, I look at all this data because I want to, you know, see, you know, what staff is looking at, making sure that it's the most appropriate route and so on. 
But um, I think that we always have to be careful because some people just throw these things at us. It's like, you should remove all these things in the winter. Nobody rides them in the winter. <laughs> you know, well, if you don't clean them, of course they're not gonna ride them in the winter. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I always uh, um, think that, again, don't get me wrong, data is super important, especially in these projects and having a before and after and continue to collect data to see how, the impacts that we're having. Um, but we do get confronted very often with this idea that, well, people are not using it. And uh, I think that we have to be keen on responding that, you know, in this sense, data is a part of the decision-making process, but it all, it all, what is leading us to create the cycling infrastructure is also to make people feel comfortable and safe to use it. Yeah, 100% agree with that. And, um, you know, data helps guide decisions, helps evaluate it, but policy and council direction is what uh, ultimately, um, you know, results in, in best outcomes. Because again, I, I think Toronto is pretty unique in the data sense, because uh, if you look at some of the first cycle tracks built in the city of Toronto, like Richmond and Adelaide, just an explosion of cycling volumes, right? And I think it actually set a very high bar and a interesting precedent. Um, you know, in Atlanta, we would do projects that would result in going from 20 people biking to 100 people biking. And in Toronto, I feel like that would be viewed as like, whatever, that's not that, you know, so we do have to start to shift in Toronto away from solely looking at utilization as a sign of success. But I think what Deputy Mayor just said about, you know, what's the safety outcomes? Um, what, you know, the people who are biking now, are we supporting them better? Um, and not just look at solely this hard data to make thresholds to say that a project is valuable or not. And I have to say that we really um, need your help on that front because so many of the cycle tracks built in the past 10 years have been in downtown where it's dense, where a lot of people were already biking. And as we um, move to try and really complete a suburban network, which is so important from a safety lens, from an equity lens, um, from a connectivity lens, that this, this discussion around utilization can shift um, and be more focused on other benefits on policy direction and not just, um, yeah, did we get to 6,000 people biking a day, which coming from Atlanta just blew, blew my mind. Um, so yeah, definitely. In, in Atlanta, when you saw 100 people bike on a road, it was like, this is amazing success. Um, so it's really a really different context in downtown versus the suburbs. Yeah, and just to add to that, some of these projects aren't, the focus isn't necessarily on cycling, it's on improving the corridor for safety for everybody using it. So something, I know we get a lot of, um, a lot of feedback in, on Scarlet Road, like Scarlet Road was a road safety project, people were driving too fast on that road, and the bike lane was just a benefit of slowing down the traffic on that road to make it safer for everybody who uses it. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's really great to hear, and, and uh, I think you know there are lots of people on this call that are sort of eagerly looking forward to seeing more data uh, from the city uh, about some of the usage, especially with some of the active TO projects. Some people on this call may have been involved with some community counts as well. It's also encouraging to hear that not just sort of having this uh, high thresholds of what needs to happen right away for success that it can be scaled based on uh, where the bike lane is and what other purposes it's serving like as Kanchin said, uh, road safety piece. Um, we'll sort of do one, uh, one last question and then uh, wrap it up. Um, and I feel, uh, you know, this is appropriate with a budget going on right now. Um, sort of wondering a question about um, how difficult is it to shift budget resources to maintenance and upgrades? So whether it's pothole repair, debris and removal in summer, snow ice removal in winter or potentially adding uh, protection. Um, more new bike lanes and more infrastructure is great, but continuous maintenance is also important and seemingly not always uh, a high priority from an outsider perspective. Maybe start with, with Deputy Mayor on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, 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 there's obviously different budgets, one that's capital, one that's operating. So, um, and I think they're equally important and we have to be pushing for both. 
um, I, I agree, you know, you can't be just building new uh, cycling routes and then not having the ones that you have being operated uh, properly. So I think it's equally important uh, and we need to be pushing for, for both. But I think that, again, um, having that uh, constant um, feedback, I mean, the reality is it was this community, it was because of the advocacy and the push, the community that we started having the cycling uh, uh, the bike lanes cleaned uh, in the winters, right? And uh, and some are still being done better than others. And so we still have improvements to make and some, some of it is budget related and some of it it's operational and how do we, it's logistics as well. Um, so, uh, you know, these are things that, that absolutely we need to make sure that the budget is responding to and, and, um, um, and both on the operating side and the capital side. Uh, Becky Kanchin, do you have anything to add on that? Maybe in terms of uh, upgrades? Well, I guess <laughs> yes. I can speak to that we do add, when we add separation, there is a, a component to it that is for maintenance, for a maintenance budget, um, for anything that we add separated and for all the snow clearing and all of that as well. Like it's, it's a priority to have it maintained and we tried try not to build something that cannot be maintained. Like we don't build something, we can't maintain it. So that's, that's one of the most important things. It's just allocating the money and the, and the, and the resources to, to do it on a, on, a, on a level of service that is adequate. Great. Uh, I don't have anything to add to this question, but maybe if I could just go on a very short tangent, come because I've just been reading the, the chat boxes, if that's okay with you, Michael, just a one sure, minute yeah. tangent. Uh, one, there was a lot of questions about the cycling network plan, both the new one and whether they're available to different wards. Um, and what I can share is that um, just quick, uh, we're looking at a summer summer report for the next near term. So that's when you'll be able to um, discuss that um, with your counselor, you know, priority projects, um, you know, the, these types of things. There'll be counselor briefings. It will actually go through a similar process of how we get to the council report for a new project. Um, so that's really exciting. And I'm happy to share all the maps by ward. Right now, they're just by district on the website. Um, but um, maybe Cycle Toronto, if you reach out to me, I can share those by ward so people, people can um, see those. Um, and because we're talking about budget, I feel like we didn't really talk about the difference between active TO and our permanent program. Um, and I just want to highlight that, you know, 2020 was a very unique year and we accelerated a lot of um, projects in that year using existing resources and shifting completely our priorities. So we inside inside of transportation services, um, after we received direction from the medical officer of health and city council, basically stopped many of the typical programs that all of you rely on, um, things like our maintenance staff, um, things like area transportation plans and neighborhood projects. And we reallocated those to get off the ground, the eight projects that you've seen. Also, it should be noted that those projects that we accelerated had some level of debate and consultation already. So you take the Bloor gap in between Avenue and Sherborne or uh, University Avenue or Wilmington Faywood. These projects have all been projects that had some level of vetting over the past 10 years. Um, and we felt that that was really important when accelerating something is that because we had to shorten the, the amount and the types of consultation um, that they had already had some level of public debate um, before accelerating them. So we are looking to continue to take some, we also received delegated authority. So we actually reversed the council process where instead of waiting till a project was fully designed, we said, please trust us uh, in this pandemic situation that we will do the consultation and we'll make changes as needed. Um, and I'm sorry to get to this at the last minute, I should have incorporated this more, but I think it's really important to understand the difference because our permanent program means that projects are extremely well vetted, are fully designed, are fully consulted on, and are permanent. So when councils endorses them, they're saying yes forever or yes, 
most likely forever. Um, whereas um, the active TO program was, they're all pilot, they're all for two years. Um, we'll trust you transportation services, don't break our trust. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, do it very quickly. We are, again, we've learned a lot from that process. And there are definitely some key takeaways of how we can continue to accelerate some projects. But there is also some key takeaways about where it's inappropriate to accelerate projects. And I think that's hard to parse even for us um, because you know it has been a true honor to serve the city during the pandemic by supporting people to safely move. Um, but there's also, you know, um, a, a lot of emotional workload challenges and, and, and challenges on our side that we face to get all, all of it done. So um, we have made recommendations in the budget to support growth um, so that we can continue to deliver more um, with a more reasonable workload. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to end on that because we didn't really address it. And I know it's a huge topic um, and we can talk about it more at other times. We're always here to talk about it, but um, you know, we, it was really, again, um, a really challenging year last year, and we're looking to learn from it and to, to support um, the city and its public and moving around safely pre, you know, during the pandemic and afterwards. And, and Michael, I, 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 I have to run as well for another meeting, but sure. after what Becky said, I think um, I, I want to publicly um, acknowledge the incredible work that that team did over this year. It is true. These projects had some consultation, but it was an incredible amount of work that the team did to deploy all that. I'm very happy to see them putting forward the request for extra resources. I'm really hopeful that, you know, we get it done, right? Uh, uh, because, you know, I can't just keep asking them to do more without giving them the You resources. can always ask. <laughs> yeah. But it, uh, the resources are needed, um, but, um, you know, the team did an incredible amount of work. And so to everybody that did the advocacy um, and continues to do the advocacy, I know that staff valued the feedback as well, but uh, I think we, uh, we I, I just want to express my gratitude to all of you publicly. Great. It's very uh, appreciated. Yeah. And we, yeah. we express our gratitude to you for always asking us to do more and to support your community. So yeah, it's great. Uh, well, thank you uh, everyone uh, for, for attending and uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Deputy Mayor Bailo, Becky Katz and Kanchan Maharaj. Um, and uh, sort of echoing what everyone else was saying. Uh, thank you for helping deliver a really historic year in new cycling infrastructure. Um, I think, you know, in the course of the pandemic, this really was one of the, you know, legitimate good news stories of the year. And uh, advocates definitely want to be part of helping make this type of expansion part of the new normal. And we're looking forward to uh, 21 and, and continuing to work with you. So thanks everyone for attending uh, this session of uh, the uh, Cycle Toronto Advocacy Forum. We still have a few more sessions uh, later today and tomorrow. So check them out on the website and sign up and join us. Uh, thanks everyone.